So I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Lindsay Walsh is the 2018 global winner in the Earth and Environmental Sciences category, and she is pursuing a master's in development practice. I'm delighted to hand you over to Lindsay, who will speak with us here today. Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I had the good fortune to listen in on a bit of Hazel Chu's talk there, which was really fascinating. Uh, she's always a good speaker. So um, very honored to be following that up and congratulations to everybody who won an award. Obviously it's such an amazing achievement and well done to everybody. And I hope your first day went well at the undergraduate awards. So I was the Earth and Environmental Sciences Global Winner in 2018. For my undergraduate dissertation which looked at how habitat influences bird abundance, diversity and feeding guilds in Calicmo Biosphere Reserve in Mexico. So I was lucky enough to go to Mexico. That picture there is me processing a bird in uh, Mexico as part of my research and that middle is me presenting my research at the undergraduate awards in 2018 and that third picture is obviously me uh, getting my medal, which is which is amazing. Since then, what have I been up to? That's what I've been asked to speak about in the past two years. So I've divided this presentation into three parts. So the first part is climate advocacy. So I'm very passionate about environmental issues, climate issues. Um, I write and I sometimes give talks on things and, and talk on podcasts. Um, so I write for a student-run publication called Stan News. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's, it's Irish, so, so obviously not all of you would be, but um, I wrote an essay on inequality and climate change in the 21st century, and I won an essay competition, and I was invited to speak at the IMF World Bank meetings as a young leader last October in Washington, which was a fantastic experience. That's me on the, the left-hand side speaking at that. Um, and it was just amazing to get to speak to an audience like that um, as part of my work, of my writing. So um, that was very cool. The middle picture is me. I'm an Antarctica climate ambassador. So this is another Irish <laughs> initiative. And um, it basically trains Irish people from all backgrounds, all ages to act and communicate on climate change. And I was lucky enough to win the 2019 Outstanding Achievement Award because I reached um, a million people in 2019, which was like, only when I totted it up was I, did I realize how many people I had reached, which was um, really amazing to me. And just shows uh, if, you, if you go out there, it's really possible to have, have a big impact if you just do little things it was things like workshops, um, book clubs with my friends, even like vegan wine and cheese evenings, very random things, but uh, they all added up. So um, that was that was cool. And the third picture is I was chosen as a G20 Young Global Changer, uh, a 2021. And this is a program that basically picks young people from all across the world to get together every month or so and discuss big issues. So I'm in the working group on climate change and we have debates and discussions and we produce things like policy briefs and presentations to politicians, world leaders, um, academics. So it, that's a really fantastic opportunity as well. And I'd really encourage everybody here to, to contact me about all these, all these kind of programs and stuff um, because I don't think I would have I would have gone forward for these kind of things if um, if it hadn't been for the undergraduate awards. Actually, it really reinforced my passion on environmental issues and and, and climate issues, and made me feel more empowered to kind of get out there and and act on them. And the experience of being surrounded by so many other passionate young people was uh, was really amazing, and it really encouraged me. So. Yeah, that was, that was a great contribution. Um, and then, so secondly, I've been researching. So um, as, um, as was mentioned, I just finished my master's in development practices, two years master's on sustainable development. And that picture on the left is me. So I got to do two big pieces of research through this master's. And the first picture is me in Peru. I got to go to the Peruvian Amazon last summer and conduct research on the sustainability of fisheries in Peru. 
And this is really cool because it fed back into community management plans there, which for me, research is amazing, but like the best thing is for it to, to have an impact and actually be used. So that was really, really cool for me to see this research that I conducted and all the data I collected then and the recommendations given back to the community that we were in and then to be used for to make their practices more sustainable. So that was very cool. Um, and the second part is it looks a bit odd, <laughs> but um, this was my master's dissertation, which basically looked at how beef farmers and key actors in the sector see the future of Irish beef farming and seeing if elements of justice are present within, within these plants. So um, for those of you who don't know, beef farming in Ireland, um, there's around 80,000 beef farmers in Ireland, so it's pretty big. Um, but it's, it's facing a lot of problems at the moment in that firstly, it's not very profitable for the ma vast majority of beef farmers. So things like the common agricultural policy, which um, basically is subsidies for, for farmers, it doubles the income of the vast majority of beef farmers. And even that, even a doubling the income they get from selling beef, they're still below the average industrial wage. Um, and then, so they've got economic problems. But then on top of that, there's so many pressures to change at different levels, obviously. Firstly, there's obviously it's being very linked to climate change now. So things like the Lancet Eat report and being told, like telling people to cut down their red meat intake. Um, issues with methane, obviously, carbon dioxide, not the only greenhouse gas. Um, things like the EU Green Deal, the farm to fork strategies, and then the fact that within Ireland, a third of our emissions come from agriculture. So it, the sector has been really highlighted and within agriculture, it's um, cattle farming that produces by far the most emissions. So lots of pressures on the industry to change, um, which brings us to the concept of a just transition. And Hazel was actually speaking about this, which I'm really glad she touched on this actually. So. For those of you who don't know, it's really, it's gained a lot of prominence in recent years within climate discourse. So it's basically saying that in transitioning to a more sustainable future, uh, that no one's left behind, as Hazel said. And so this thing's like in coal mining communities that are obviously being shut down and, and they're being told to stop practices, that these communities aren't just left to deal with this burden on their own, that they're supported through the transition through often through things like retraining or um, monetary compensation. So this, um, as I said, it's been gaining a lot of prominence, but it's hardly ever being considered in the agricultural sector. Just transition to agricultural sector don't, don't seem to go together in academia as so far. So I looked at um, whether these three elements, so just as kind of hard to define, it's, it can mean different things to different people. So I used, a tripartite definition of justice, which basically has these three elements here. Uh, participation, are farmers participating in the decisions that are, that are impacting them? Uh, recognition, are their values being recognized, their lived experience being recognized? And distribution, which is mostly what just transition focuses on in, in general when it's being carried out in practice, uh, which is a, a distribution of the burden and benefits in a transition. So I find basically, long story short, that there is a huge misalignment between key actors who are key actors are the government, the Irish Farmers Association, big influential bodies like that. Um, they mostly focus on distribution, which is very much often the case. And their solution to all the problems that I listed facing beef farming are very much market fixes, things like better branding, opening up to new markets, um, getting more under the under the cap. So um, Obviously distribution issues of distribution are hugely important, but uh, they're not the only thing. And this was really seen in my interviews with beef farmers. Um, so they're obviously very concerned with their income because the job is not a very low income job. Um, but issues of recognition and participation are hugely important to them also. So for many, the practice of beef farming is so linked to their identity. Like they see themselves as the beef farmer and like that's what they're seen as within the community um, so things like retraining schemes it wouldn't work in this instance um, even though they're kind of being touted within discussions in Ireland around a just transition it, this wouldn't fix this issue basically because 
they don't do it for the money they do it for it, it, it they're tied to the land and the tie it gives them to previous generations who farm the land um and they don't feel like they're being represented in discussions or by like organizations like the ifa and they um, don't feel like they're giving a proper opportunity to participate in discussions at governmental level. So this is very important. Um, this issue is really early stages and in any transition, early planning is really key and it's, it's just not happening here. So um, can't really ignore this misalignment that this piece of research has found. And I'm currently in the process of peer review, which anyone who's gone through it knows how painful it is. Um, so hopefully this will be published in the new year. Okay, on to the third. So I've also been working, so as part of my master's, we do a placement. I undertook a placement in the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Climate Change, in Bonn in Germany, um, in the capacity building team, which basically helps low and middle income countries to build their capacity to reduce emissions and adapt to climate change, which was really, really fascinating. The middle picture is because I started in March and had to move back to Ireland to remote work because of COVID. Put my three months deposit down, my rent and everything and had to move back. Um, so yeah, that was my experience of remote working. But yeah, it was still fascinating and I learned so much. It was, it was a brilliant experience. Um, and I've since graduated actually, so I got my results for all my thing and everything. So uh, I'm properly graduated now. And um, the picture of me looking very formal on the right is um, I'm currently undertaking a traineeship in the European Commission in the cabinet of Maraid McGuinness. So she's a um, commissioner for financial services, financial stability and the capital markets union, which is a big, big sentence. But um, basically, I'm very interested in the intersection between research and policy making. So this is a fantastic experience to gain insight into, into the, the political side of things and policy making. So um, that's what I'm currently doing. And so key takeaways from that I would like to give are, so the undergraduate awards, I think above all, they really gave me confidence in my abilities and my, my capabilities. Um, and you, I think everybody here should really take that forward and use it to go out and, and act on issues that, that they're very passionate about. It did that for me anyway. It, it, the community here is a great one. I mean, really, you can take the opportunity to take such inspiration from it. It really opened my eyes to all the other areas of research going on and, and seeing these like young people who are so passionate about their specific areas was really fascinating and actually gave me, gave me the idea of how all this research really intersects. And I think you can get very bogged down in your own area of research and very tunnel vision, but I think we need interdisciplinary research more than ever. And, and that's really important. That's something you can really take away from this summit. Um, also the opportunities it's, it's given me have been really brilliant. I mean, every interview I go on, they ask me about it and they're always so impressed by, by not the award even, but the, that this whole initiative exists and that it brings together and celebrates undergraduate research. Uh, all interviews have been very impressed with that. And I think it is something brilliant from the undergraduate awards. Um, and then lastly, I know I saw the, the summit timetable somewhere that um, there's a session on burnout or something, but I, I know I'm sure the group here are very, all very high achieving, very hard working. And that if there's one thing I've learned in the past few years, it's just to take time away from all the work sometimes and just let yourself do nothing let yourself be a little bit lazy sometimes because it is really easy to just put too much pressure on yourself and it, it's better a role if, if you do take that time for yourself sometimes so um yeah so hopefully you guys got something from that and i'd be happy to take any questions down my emails there if you if you want to ask any other questions Thank you very much for your presentation and for speaking with us here today. I have a question from an attendee. Do voices like Hazel Chu's inspire you in your climate research? Absolutely. I mean, Hazel Chu is so impressive. She's so well spoken. Um, her career is really inspiring. And just when you listen to all the stuff she has to deal with every day, I follow her on Twitter and I've, I've seen some of the stuff that 
that she experiences and it's just I couldn't imagine actually going through that and still doing your job so well still being so committed never giving up um yeah I think she's she's very inspiring thank you um I have a question from Elena Kale so she's saying how do you have internship that says will help low-income countries reduce their emissions uh Elena said that they would struggle with this morally since countries such as Togo or Malaysia have never been massive polluters. For, okay, so this is the internship with the UNFCCC. Um, so it's not the program that I was in, the capacity building team. It wasn't just to help them reduce their emissions. Obviously, some countries are hard. I mean, I think the continent of Africa is responsible for something like 5% of total emissions. Like, it, it's tiny um compared to Europe and the US which is like almost half of historical emissions so yes I really agree with that point but the program we were working with also helps those countries to build their own capacity to adapt to the impacts of climate change so yeah there's low-lying islands are obviously hardly contribute anything to emissions but they are sadly going to be impacted which is the inequality of climate change but um so this program also helped to advise them on how to adapt to that Thank you very much, Lindsay. I have a, another question. Um, what did you learn about sustainability first and what makes you so passionate about it? Uh, sustainability. This is one thing I have to say, the term sustainability, it could, I feel like it's so, and I use it myself, but it's so used now that it's almost lost meaning, if you know what I mean? Like it's just so interchangeable with other things and it's very much been caught up with the whole greenwashing movement. So I have, I've kind of moved away from that, but it's hard to find a replacement word sometimes. So yeah, I do find myself using it. But um, when did I first? I've always been very passionate about like the natural world. So I suppose that was my in and I studied zoology as an undergraduate. That's, that's why I got to do the, the research in Mexico. So I think, I think it's always been there. It's very hard to pinpoint a specific time that I, I got very interested in it but I suppose I started with the conservation side of things and was very very passionate about like animal conservation and then I just studying it at university level I, it was so obvious how interconnected it was to all these other environmental issues um, and then when I saw the human side of it with climate change and how it impacts populations that, that I was just like so horrified by it I suppose is the word um that I felt like I, I really wanted to to work on this um thank you I have another question for you that's a bit more specific to your research in Ireland so how do you think the average older age of bee farmers in Ireland is relevant to the climate issues that you've been discussing so how the how the age of farmers is relevant to um so yeah I've, I've Bee farmers, I think, I don't have statistics on bee farmers specifically, actually, but uh, I know farmers in Ireland, something only like 5% are under the age of 35. So yeah, it is hugely skewed towards an older demographic. But um, I, a lot of the ones I spoke to, you do hear this like in the media, it is kind of painted of like environmentalists versus farmers and that maybe farmers don't really, don't really care, but they, they definitely do. They just have... <laughs> very important other things that are much more immediate to them such as like trying to make a living income that um i can see why they wouldn't be immediately vocal about issues such as climate change because a they might not really witness it that much in certain cases and others and also because they have much more pressing things to deal with in the immediate term that's right in front of them so um all the ones I spoke to, they no one was like a climate change denier or anything. They all were like, yes, it's it's very important, but they were very fearful of first of all this whole narrative that's kind of as I was saying with like the third of emissions in Ireland coming from agriculture that they feel like they're almost being used as a scapegoat sometimes, and and there, there's a bit of a pushback against that obviously because it's not really it's not their fault at all, um, and also. Yeah, they were they're very cooperative and they're willing to like switch to more sustainable practices if the funding is there. So I don't think that there needs to be this kind of like us and them between the environmental movement and, and farming. Um, I don't think that narrative is really helpful, but it does come up again and again. But once you speak to the actual farmers, like that narrative doesn't really exist. They 
everybody I spoke to was was very much like, okay, something needs to be done on climate. Brilliant, Lindsay. Thank you very much for the time that you took to speak with us here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And also for taking so many of our questions.